The views and opinions of the guests of Veterans Archives do not reflect the views and opinions of Veterans Archives, its subsidiaries, or its partners. Hello and welcome to Veterans Archives. This is a podcast where you can learn about our military history in the words and voices of the men and women who lived and created it. I'm your host, Bill Krieger, and let's listen to our next story. All right, this is Chris Vetter with Veterans Archives. Today's date is December the 8th, 2023, and we are here with Larry Vetter, who is also my dad, um, which, so this is a really cool interview. Um, and what service did you serve in, Dad? United States Army Reserve. All right. Um, let's start back to the beginning. Where and uh, when were you born? I was born October 16th, 1949 at Mount Carmel Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. And then where um, where did you live growing up? I was born and raised in Livonia all okay. my life. Okay. So uh, what do you remember uh, what schools you went to? I went to Central Elementary and then I transferred over to Boxford Elementary. And from there, I went to Junior High at Clarenceville, and then across the street to the high school. Okay, Clarenceville High School. Clarenceville High School. Yes. All right. Did you uh, did you have uh, a mother and a father? And I know the answer to this, but it's yes. part of the interview. Yes. My dad, Robert Guy Vetter, okay. and my mom, Ruth Winifred Vetter. Haven't heard Winifred in a minute. Um, your dad, did he serve in the military My at all? My dad served in the United States Navy during World War II. Do you remember the dates at all? Um, I think he went in in 1944, but I'm not 100% positive of that. Okay. And uh, did he see any action? Was he deployed anywhere? He was in the South Sea Islands, and he did not see any action. So he was on a boat there in the South Pacific there? <laughs> Not a hundred percent positive that he was on a boat. I he very well could have been okay. on on the shore. Okay, but when on the conclusion of World War II, did he he came home and was discharged, or did he serve after that at all? No, he came home. He was discharged with the termination of the war and came home. He was married and had, uh, I believe, two daughters. Okay, three, two daughters and a son when he was serving. Okay. Well, I guess that leads us into our, my next question. Uh, who were your siblings? And then where were you in the pecking order of the children? My oldest mm -hmm. sister, Barbara, uh, is 85 and we still have her. We lost my second sister, Sharon, who would be 84. Okay. She was residing in Minnesota for a number of years with her husband. And then my brother, Robert, uh, he um, lives just about uh, 20 miles from me in Gregory, Michigan. And then he was the third, and then I was the fourth. I came nine years after my brother, which made me, obviously, the baby of the family. Okay. So you probably had a uh, uh, learned from them growing up, maybe a little faster than others, huh? Well, I had that opportunity, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Sure. Um, so you said you went to Clarenceville high school. Did you do any sports? Uh, were you, uh, you know, uh, part of the debate team? Any, any, uh, were you the homecoming King? What, what was going on in high school? Okay. In high school, I was on student council all four years, nine through 12. Uh, I wrestled on, the on the wrestling team. Um, I, uh, played baseball and tried a, brick, a very brief stint on, in football, but was that for me. Not your thing? No. And then um, I know, I'll just bring it up, hockey's very big in our family. Did you play hockey in high school? I, I did, but not for the high school because high schools didn't have high school programs back then. Okay, interesting. So tell me a little bit about that. How did that work? Well, uh, back then there wasn't much ice around. Um, I, Livonia had one team that I played for, uh, and our home ice was Garden City. Yeah, at that time, it was an outdoor rink, and it is now an indoor rink. And uh, we 
were always looking for ice, not able to always find ice, uh, unlike today. But it was a game that I really loved. I uh, also would uh, go up to my grandma and grandpa's, which lived, they lived in Calumet. And uh, up there, uh, I played hockey uh, nonstop whenever I went up there in the wintertime. Okay. So pretty much outside of uh, going to school and the everyday life of a, of a high schooler, it sounds like hockey was your, your favorite pastime. Yep. And then I also got a job at a gas station. Oh, okay. Which, so did you do that after school or? No, I did, did it while I was in school. So it was like a, uh, kind of like a, a work program, so to speak. Did you yeah. get credit for it? I don't think so. I don't recall. Okay. That. I don't gotcha. It was organized like that. Back okay. Then. Gotcha. But my, Best friend Rick uh, got a job at Standard Station in Redford Township on Grand River. Then, when I turned 16, got me a job and I worked there for uh, until I was out of school. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So, doing the math, 1949 was your birth year. Um, I'll let you speak on what year you graduated, but we that's in a pretty uh, important era as far as. Um, American military was Vietnam era. So uh, what year did you get out of high school? And then what was that like knowing that that was going on overseas? Um, and then uh, did they implement a draft uh, around that time? Yes. Uh, back then, the Vietnam War was uh, starting to really, really heat up. I graduated in 1967. Like your son, I was a year ahead because of I started when I was four, as did your son, Braden. And uh, with that... So how old were you when you got out of high school then? I was 17, but 17. I was 16 at, at, for a couple months. I was 16 as a senior. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So I was 17. And uh, so with that, uh, uh, Vietnam was getting to be a big issue, uh, even when I retired, excuse me, even when I graduated. And uh, then, uh, of course, that the magic number was 19 because there was a draft. And uh, in 69, when I turned 19, they were drafting mega m numbers of people. So what do you mean the magic number was 19? I'm well, not 19 many is are... what your draft age. Oh, okay. So that was, I thought it was 18. Oh, that's interesting. No, Maybe a lot of people don't know had, that. We had to register at 18, but then at 19, you could randomly be picked and people were, were being randomly picked, which I was. Do you know the formula on how that was picked or uh, do you no, recall? It's just random. It's random. Uh, they later had a lottery. Uh, so your birthday was assigned to a number that was drawn in the lottery and that you in a draft order. So a, but, a lottery like we know today, like a big spinny thing with balls in it? Yes, they did. That's okay. exactly what they had. Wow. Okay. Yeah. In fact... Uh, getting a little bit ahead only to come back. Uh, they had their first lottery when I was in basic training. And it was really a fun time. Now, if I would have prolonged not being drafted, I would have been drafted because I think my number is 70 something. But there were some people in there that had just, we just had entered into basic and they were high, high numbers. I can't remember for sure, but they were real high and they were sick because it was a matter of probably about three, three months. If they were delayed, they probably wouldn't have went in. And so back then, most people were not very eager to go to Vietnam or to go in the military. And so with that being said, I had, uh, I had a friend that told me about this, uh, post, the uh, 906, uh, detachment. It was a military intelligence outfit down in East Detroit on Sherwood, I remember. And uh, real, real quick, real quick. Um, so you 1967 out of high school, 18 and 68 registered for what is it? Selective service, I assume. Yes. Selective service. Then 19 and 1969. What were you doing at that point in your life was, out of high school? Yes. I I worked uh, at Sun Control when I first got out for a couple months. My dad encouraged me to go over and sign up to 
uh, worked at the city of Livonia because I wanted to get into forestry. And so with that, uh, I went through testing as every civil service job requires. And uh, I, um, it was kind of ironic because a friend of mine, uh, Pat McDonald, uh, he also took it, but we had two different sessions. He finished number one and I finished number two. So we were the first two uh, that were interviewed and we both accepted positions with the city and uh, city of Livonia. But uh, Mr. Demick, who was the superintendent who interviewed me and, and offered me a job, uh, I conveyed to him that I really wanted to work in forestry. And he says, well, we have. And at that point in time, he was going to hire me. He had said that he was going to hire me. But after I told him that, he was very uh, gracious. And he says, I'll make a deal with you. Uh, we have an opening in the water department. And uh, we would like for you to give it a try. And uh, the deal I'll make is that try it for a week. If you like it, you can stay. And if not, I'll put you in forestry. So as you know, the rest is history. Uh -huh. I, I made uh, the water department a um, 31 and a half year job that I just absolutely loved. And uh, so with that, I was uh, situated there, but backing up if I can uh -huh. uh, about... Uh, Yep, we, we just want to keep it in order. So we're in 1969, you're working full time. The Did you want to go into the service? I, and be honest, yeah. we, you know, it's Vietnam. I understand, a lot of us understand seeing the documentaries. What was the, uh, the mental state of you and maybe an average 19 year old male? Yeah, nobody wanted to go. Um, okay. I guess there's probably few exceptions. Um, and uh, those I didn't know, but I'm sure they were very few and far between. Most everybody did not want to go. And I understand that. Yeah. So you mentioned your draft number, um, and it was a lo uh, a lottery. A lottery, that right? Was for you, okay. So it was a the draft as we know it, right? Yeah. Before just, then, yeah. Before then, they just had a draft where they randomly took names. So you're 19, almost 19, just turned 19. And your friend uh, tells you about a detachment in Detroit. You can go ahead and pick up on that. Yeah. And so he's 1969, correct? At this point, 69. At okay. this point, it was March. Uh, when my friend told me about um, this one, not everybody, not, excuse me, let me rephrase that. Not every reserve center was was open to accepting signatures because they had such a influx of people wanting to avoid the draft. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you're obviously fulfilling an obligation to the country. But with that, uh, uh, I went over there and uh, Mr. Debelon Debelonaw, he was a French man, really nice guy. He was their uh, recruiter, whatever else. And uh, so I signed up. And then uh, come uh, the end of May, I went to the mailbox and everybody feared this, reaching in that mailbox and, and finding that big, thick envelope. And it was a draft, your draft induction from the president of the United States. Okay. So, so you knew what it was, maybe you had some friends that already had seen that or you mm -hmm. saw it on the, the news or whatever. Yeah. So what was your, your, you're already in at this point with reserves, any, any, how was your processing? You took a physical okay. or did you take a okay. test? I was not in with the, with the reserves yet. Okay. Um, what was the process? I got, I got the, I got the um, induction notice and I was going to be inducted June 30th of, of the next month. This was the very end. And of this May. is with the reserves. This was what I signed up with the United States army reserve. So did, had you already taken your physical and your no, aptitude I test? I had done nothing. Okay. There you just signed. Well, I just signed to get on the list to be called by them. Okay. Like, gotcha. And not everybody, in fact, the majority of people did not get called and the majority of people ended up getting drafted. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, I was sick. I thought I was gone. So, so, okay. So the draft letter comes in, you had already signed with the reserves and it hasn't sworn in, but you're doing, you're on the, the waiting list, so to speak, right? For lack yeah, of a better I, term. And, and, and then you get the induction or the uh, draft letter in the mail and you're not feeling too good about it. No. So we pick up right so, there. So on the 18th, we get a phone call from Mr. Devlin and all. 
and he and he says, uh, "Would you be interested in coming aboard and joining us with the in the Army Reserve with their, our detachment?" And I says, and I was just sick. I thought I was done. I thought I was drafted. I says, "You know what? I I got a draft notice uh, on the thirtieth of May." And he says, he says, when well, he looked, he says, well, you signed up with us in March. He says, then that doesn't disqualify you. You can still join the reserves if you want. And I says, do I want? <laughs> and he says, well, do you want? And I says, yes. And so he says, can you be down here tomorrow? And I said, you better believe it. So I went down there, got sworn in, signed up, and I was in. I was no longer going to be drafted. That's interesting. So there was no physical back then or uh, do you remember taking I, a physical I, uh, uh doing an aptitude test any of that stuff i know i took tests i can't remember the order i, I either I, way I, either way you're you're all good you're in the army reserves yes, okay. yes and and then they i did take testing i believe it was after okay i was the military intelligence unit they had not everything open they had a place in fact another guy that um that i became friends with he likewise got the same call and he likewise was excited and they had positions as a cook and I took it and that way I got into the Army Reserve and uh, but didn't stop there. My big night, the 19th. 19th uh, of what? Of one of month? June. Okay. And that was, I went down to East Detroit on Sherwood the Army Reserve Center there, signed up, came home and I was happy. Mm -hmm. uh, because everybody knew the difference. What was it, it? Okay. Explain that for people that are going to be listening to this in the future. What do you mean by the difference or the sense of relief uh, by not being drafted versus joining the army reserve? Well, what, it, what was the stigma or maybe even the truth in some scenarios? Yeah. The difference is if I would have went through and been drafted, I would have been whatever they wanted me to be. And the majority of the people obviously were, infantry out in the jungle in Vietnam. That was the majority, not everybody, but the majority, vast majority. Uh, and with joining the Army Reserve, the difference between the reserves and being drafted into the regular Army, the reserves, you by and large stayed home. You trained and prepared, but I never got called. The, the unit never got called up. Well, of course, as we'll talk further, I ended up transferring to another unit. Okay. But well, tell, uh, uh, tell us about that. So you we, we're in June 19th, you're at the reserve unit. And then okay, what yeah. happens what there? Happens, yeah. Same so I nowhere. Home, and I went over to my friend's Ram. Mm -hmm. And I uh, had a 128 Ram Air Cobra Jet Mustang, which was just beautiful. And so we had a friend that had a Chevy 2, 327, 360 horse. Chevy 2, which was really fast. So we decided we were going to go out and race. We went out on an eight mile to race. And this was late. This is probably close to midnight. In fact, I think my clock in my car said it was a little after midnight. So right there we were. So we went out and we raced and we was coming back from the race. And I ended up getting into a head on collision with another car. And there on eight mile, it was double lane with a center turn lane. And that's where we hit head on is in the center turn lane. And uh, my life was forever changed. In fact, I was just a chiropractor today. And the reason being uh, because of that accident back in, back in 1969, I've had ongoing neck and back problems ever since. It's most certainly has lessened and gotten much better, but I am... Uh, my wife is sitting over. She can probably recall times when it was very, very difficult uh, having had that injury and then dealing with it ongoing. Back then, my the big issue was I had um, brain swelling, nothing like my son and your brother, but yet it was an issue. And that was their focus. They took me to Boxford Hospital, which was only a couple of miles from the accident site and transferred me over to Wayne County where they had a neurosurgeon on staff. And um, I was there uh, a week and I don't know if it was in trauma or whatever it was back then. I don't remember. I don't even remember being in the hospital. But at any rate, uh, I came home, but they didn't put me in a neck collar. They didn't address my, my 
terrible situation with whiplash and my back problem. And it only got worse from there. Okay. So sounds like you obviously had a traumatic experience there. Um, any setbacks as far as your uh, process with the reserve then? Would it, no. Were you a recruiter's dream or, or, excuse me, nightmare by you getting hurt as a recruit? Or no. were you good to go? You know what? I just uh, yeah. convalescing. Uh, I went in to do my training in uh, for that year. So what was that? Uh, uh, six months later from the accident. And uh, I was an off, off of work for a month. Uh, but then it was determined that I was fine. Uh, and then I went in, uh, I can't remember exactly what my entrance date was. It was in October, I remember. And of Entrance course, uh, as in going to basic training? Going to basic training. I okay. went to Fort Bliss, Texas, El Paso yep. to do my basic training. And then I did my AIT over at Fort Huachuca, which is in Arizona. We did. So our- do you remember what your MOS was? Uh, were your MOS training at Fort Hachuca? Uh, I was a cook. You were a cook. Yeah. Okay. And then do you have any um, stories from basic training? Always, everyone yeah, always so, has got yeah. a few. Basic so, training. so day one, you remember, so you're on the plane, you fly down there, I assume to oh, El Paso yeah, and then uh, you show up, you're there. What happens? Yeah. All alone. I, uh, we, uh, those from the reserve unit, you went wherever the normal, uh, for the men in our area, went down to Fort Knox and trade. That was the normal place to go. But reservists, we went. And I went down to, and I was the only one for my unit uh, because, of course, it's sparse. But I didn't even went down there. As you said, I I uh, flew down there, and uh, uh, we went to uh, uh, Zero Week, which is the what is it called? The uh, reception battalion reception station. Yes. We, I was there for a whole week. Okay. And as you know, I don't know how long you were there, but at any rate, if I said to myself, this is great. Uh, and so uh, anyhow, I was. Why, why was it great? It was great. Because no one's ever we, said those words in okay, basic training. It was great because I wasn't in basic training yet. Well, I was at reception zero station. week part of it. Yeah. yeah. And um, because nobody was yelling at me, we could eat, we would do things. And so, but so finally, uh, then about a week after I got there, uh, they told us they were coming to get us. So they came. Come, to who's work. coming to get you? Uh, the drill sergeant. Okay. The cattle. So this is probably your training unit drill sergeants, right? Yes. The ones you will be with for the next, how long? Two months, nine weeks, uh, something uh, like that. Well, it was eight weeks. Eight weeks. Yeah, okay. It's okay. So, um, so I being very naive, uh, we were, we were sitting all on our duffel bags waiting for the, uh, cattle cars to come. We call them cattle cars because you stood up in the back and like cows. And so we call them. Makes cattle sense. Cows. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, so I'm sitting there and a drill sergeant, I'll never forget his name, drill sergeant Drake, uh, he was just a little punk, <laughs> but uh, at any rate. And this is late 1969, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so uh, I was sitting there and he walked through and I looked up and I smiled at him and he went ballistic. <laughs> he, he, he says, what are you doing? And I I was floored because I've never had anybody react like that when I smiled at him just being friendly. And you were just turned 19. And right? I just turned 19, yeah. And so he swore at me like I never heard before in my life. He used words I never had heard of. And uh, so he was obviously on me. And uh, so uh, I we started uh, uh, the uh, basic training, and the majority of our platoon was reservist. So it was really a great platoon. We were platoon of the cycle. We were so did the drill sergeants uh, give you a little crap for being so, in the reserve? So, okay. Uh, no, they 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 never brought up the reserves. I don't even know if they knew, but they never brought it up. But this drill sergeant, Drake, was, uh, like I said, a little punk. And uh, with that, he was on me. Well, 
on you after the first day or yeah, for, just on me. so he after that smile me. he remembered you and yeah, exactly. he was on you he thought i was a smart aleck for that well reason. that that's no fun no and it wasn't fun but but sergeants that were i mean they were mean too but they weren't unreasonable like this guy was this guy jumped on his hobby horse and thought he was king tut and so finally he got uh he got transferred out of the uh company and he only came back in the last week i don't know where he went uh but i really firmly believe that he got transferred up because he's just so unreasonable with me it would have been pure hell if he would have stayed the whole eight weeks for me because he was just i mean and i was a very good troop uh and uh Physically fit, did what you're told the first I was, time. I was Always, number three oh, in the oh, company oh, in their in the training. Okay, but on in the sixth week of training, uh, I they told me to go over to your early room, so I went over there, and uh, they said we got a phone call, and I so I was really kind of shocked by it, so I was handed it to it, and it was somebody with the Red Cross on the other end, and they said we're sorry to inform you that your nephew Gary has died. And uh, it was then it was it was really hard. I really broke down. And so uh, how old was your nephew? Uh, he was 22 months when he died. Oh, and wow. So now I was the Army reservist that the reservist status surfaced there because there if I was regular Army, they were required to let me go home. But as a reservist, there was not that requirement. So was but he he your sister's uh my sister who has who has since died. So that would have been Sharon. Uh Sharon. Uh that was her, her twenty two months. Her, and months, do, yeah. do you remember how he passed? Let's take a quick break. Veterans Archives is a five oh one C three nonprofit organization, and we rely on donations from our listeners. If you are enjoying these stories and would like to support our continued efforts, Please go to www.veteransarchives.org and select the donate button. Thank you. He had, uh, I'm not really positive. I, I'm, I'm not really positive. I would uh, not describe it properly. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so the, uh, the orderly said, go over to headquarters, mm -hmm. company headquarters. So I went over there. Of course, I knocked on the door. The command sergeant major was at the door. He saw that I was crying. I was crying. I wasn't crying, but it was obvious, I guess. So he invited me in. <clears throat> captain Walla, I'll never forget him, the captain or CEO, uh, said, uh, he says, you want to go home? And I says, well, I says, it would be nice. And he says, well, you can. He says, how long do you want to go for? That's exactly what he said. And I says, uh, I don't know, sir. He says, how about a week? I said, okay. And he says, you got the money to go home? And I says, I don't know. He says, you let me know. He says, we'll get you the money. And so I went back and I had the stash and I had the money. As it turned out, they made all the arrangements. How did they pay you back then? How did Was it they gave you a paycheck every week or you didn't, you didn't know you had money until the end of basic training? Well, uh, As you said you didn't know if you had money. I mean, yeah, that's well, kind of alarming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You didn't have money in basic training? I mean, we did, but we got paid electronically. So that's why I was okay, wondering, well, did we, they give we, you a fat? We got paid. We undoubtedly got paid uh, by cash or probably a check. We'd go over to PX and probably cash it. I can't remember that. Okay, sure. gotcha. So that, that money was from what you made down there? Yes, okay. yes. And so uh, with that, so I did have it. So I went back and told him, he says, that that's fine. So he said, so he let me go home and which was, which was again, not nothing that they were required to do. And so huh, that's not the end of that story. So I went home, of course, with the funeral. This is week six of basic training? Week six. Okay. And that is, um, that I missed where you go over everything. Mm -hmm. uh, learning what from, you applied yeah the more classroom you have your the last week uh you have uh where all your testing is done and, and field and, training know, exercise yeah I mean, everything and so uh i got back and i got back just the day before it was going to start the testing 
And uh, so uh, everybody, and I realized the importance of it then, not realizing it prior to, uh, that, uh, that you had to be perfect and sharp with everything when they call a left face, right face, left face, whatever, I prayed rest. You had to be sharp and acceptable to that uh, particular sergeant who was running that uh, particular uh, oh. station. Mm -hmm. And so anyhow, so I, I kind of hesitated in my second one, my second station, and uh, the drill sergeant, excuse me, the sergeant, there was drill sergeants weren't involved. The drill, the sergeant there said, he says, don't worry, he says, you already passed. And I says, what? And he says, you're, you're good. Don't worry about it. So they had already arranged that I was going to pass, whether I missed would, it or not, it or given not. your situation. Yeah, given my situation. So Captain Walla, I'll never forget how he was so gracious and kind to allow that to happen. So everybody, of course, when, you know, everybody was with me, it was, wow, your luck out and everything. Well, there's two people that didn't make it. Uh, and it was more of a rarity for somebody not to make it, but there was two people. And so with that, I made it. And so from there, we were at Fort Bliss and any, any crazy stories in basic training though, besides uh, Captain Drake? Any uh, issues? Drill Sergeant Drake. Or Drill Sergeant Drake, Drake excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I remember uh, we had a Drill Sergeant just came back from um, Drill Sergeant Fields, real a big guy, and he just came back from Vietnam and he's going to finish out his time as a Drill Sergeant. And I think that was the case with Drake too, but I wasn't sure about that. And so we had... Uh, this, our head drill sergeant was drill sergeant field. And, uh, and, uh, he was, he was crazy. He was just a nut <laughs> and everybody knew he was, I think the other drill sergeants as well. And, uh, he would just go berserk. People were scared of him because he was really big too, but he was crazy. <laughs> he was a prototype drill sergeant that you heard about. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so one of the more fun times is, is that the drill sergeants, uh, and I forget what week this was, but they, uh, usually it was a Friday night. They usually went out, drank while well, they came, they decided to mess with the trainees. They came, come busting in. And I was the first bed in the door. And, uh, so of course, when they came in, you, you you know, my obligation was jump up and, and call everybody to attention uh, because of them coming in. And uh, so they come busted in. I think there was three of them. All, they were drunk, terribly drunk. and But they were yelling and screaming. And then after they yelled and screamed at us for a short time, they said, everybody out in the quadrangle. That's where we did a drill and ceremony and different things. And so everybody had to hurry up and get dressed. Of course, you wore helmet liners that sat appropriately on your head. And uh, so we get out there, and there was a uh, trainee called Gomez. And Gomez uh, 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 couldn't speak English at all. And I don't think he, he was looking real hard at failing so they wouldn't have to go in. So... There, we're all out there in formation, and Gomez just so happens to be in the front row. And Gomez, when he came out, he didn't come out with his with his uh, liner. He came out with a steel pot on top of his head, no liner. <laughs> and so they saw him, and they started calling him names, being a turtle because he looked like a turtle. And so they really messed with him, and they ended up forgetting about us and then told us to go back in. So whatever they were going to do to us, which probably wouldn't have been good that night because they were really cranked up. They let us off the hook because of Gomez. They just had their fun with him. So Gomez was the hero. He was the hero. Yeah. Unsung hero for us. So after that was, uh, obviously a rough night, but, um, your graduate basic training after you come back from the, the, uh, seven days leave, 
um, a couple of weeks later, and then Fort Hachuca, which Definitely. is in Arizona, right? So yes. did you fly or drive over there? Or? Uh, the bus, probably a bus, right? I, I think so. I really can't okay. remember to be honest with you. And then you it wasn't were, very far though. No, no, yeah, it's right up the road. So then you're doing uh, training to be a cook. Yeah. Okay, so I don't have the best outlook for army cook. So what did you uh, would you get trained on? Well, you trained as a cook, and I was fulfilling my obligation just okay. like the rest of them. We had we had. Uh, I remember Bill Walker was a school teacher in Chicago. Uh, people were didn't care they were in the reserves they weren't in the regular army so you yeah. guys were looking forward to doing what you had to do to go home and yes. get back to your regular yeah. jobs or yeah. whatever that's okay that's exactly right and yeah. uh, any fun stories there at for hachuka you know what i had a fun story i omitted uh is this back yeah, to basic training basic training okay yes. go ahead so, yeah Bivouac uh, we FTX were, is yeah, what it's called now yeah. <laughs> range which is in new mexico that's where we bivouac and uh we of course had an orientation class telling us the the perils of being out in the desert and um now this was in november and so it wasn't hot hot but it was still the desert and so one of the things the instructor brought up is snakes well as you know i have a terrible phobia of snakes i can't even look at a picture of snakes. That was back from a childhood incident we yeah. don't need to talk about, but right. that's right. right. Okay. And so with that, uh, I was sweating bullets, not knowing, because uh, you, we were going to be camping out there. And of course, everybody had their shelter halves and we put two together. We had a little tent. And so he informed us that the cycle before us, one of the trainees, in fact, I just told this story just the other day to somebody, I can't remember who, uh, but some way the, the trainee got in his sleeping bag with a rattlesnake. It was in his bag. Now, I don't know how he didn't get bit getting in, but he did. But the incredible thing to talk about almost another miracle, they got him out without being bit. But uh, they were passing on to us is that you do not just get in your sleeping bag like this trainee did. You got a weapon, you poke it. And uh, make sure nothing's in there before you get in there, because otherwise you might not be so lucky like he was. And wow. so, yeah. So anyhow, and also too, uh, everybody told me prior to going in the army, do not tell anybody that you're scared of snakes because they'll they'll be unmerciful. Well, I had I got close friends with uh, my other platoon mates, and they were all reservists, so uh, not all. There, I think there's maybe six that weren't, that were regular army, and then the rest were reservists. And so everybody was really close and, and good people. And so I told a lot of them through the courses of conversation that I had this phobia. So we were out on during bivouac, and there was a commotion out about probably 25 yards from us. And uh, what what was said is that the drill sergeants had killed a rattlesnake and they were they were scaring some guys with it. And uh, so it was really awesome because my, not the whole platoon, but several of the guys encircled me to, to hide me. And so I wouldn't be noticed uh, by the drill sergeants because they wouldn't have cared. They would have found that out. They would have put that thing on me and I would have died. There's no way I'd be able to cope with that. But anyhow, they protected me. So that was one of the more unique uh, and scary things I experienced in Bitwap. Okay, so you didn't have to deal with... And also, too, one other thing, too. No, I did. Uh, the last night we had night fire. I'm sure you probably did, too. But preceded that was a forced march. And I can't remember. It was five, six miles with full gear, weapon, everything. And uh, we were told that the first, uh, I can't remember, three, four, five guys that that were, that made it, the first three or four or five that finished first wouldn't have to dry fire, go a night fire, excuse me. And so I was one of those, so I didn't have it. And, and that night, that night, our last night out, uh, during the course of the night, it snowed 10 inches. 
which was a rarity out in New Mexico. Yeah, I but guess so. And, wow. And it was real cold. I mean, it was in the upper 20s, but it snowed 10 inches and it was really kind of cool. But I was in a in a little shack loading clips. Oh, magazines. Instead of being okay. in magazines instead of being out uh, crawling under these wild wire with machine guns. And it's snowing. And it's snowing. And it's snowing. So wow. I ever got, I ended up earning that good duty as did three or four other guys did too. Of course. So graduate, you go to Fort Huachuca. You're in Arizona, right? Then what do you do? How long were you there? What did you do? And then what was that experience okay. like? Uh, well, it was it was a fun experience. I I uh, uh, developed a friendship with Roy Ramirez, one of the nicest guys that I probably ever met and still will be. Uh, and he uh, was from California. He was obviously uh, in the cooking school, and we became very good friends. And he was his parents owned a uh, a winery. Uh, well, they owned a farm and they grew grapes and they owned a winery. They were rich. And the reason why I knew that is because after basic, he was able to get his uh, GT500 Mustang and brought it to AIT. And so he was my best friend and there and we were great friends. And so we would go into town when we were able to on weekends and it was really great with him. And then what town was by Fort Huachuca? Uh, Sierra Vista. Okay. Yeah. And uh, open pit mines down there. It's really an ugly area. Uh, and Fort Huachuca was, uh, they had said it had been condemned uh, after World War II. But of course, you know, here we were. That's <laughs> where we stayed. And it was fine. Yeah. It was and how long were you there? Eight weeks as well. So another eight weeks. Yep. And did you learn anything? Uh, uh with your cooking skills i no. mean i i remember you were a really good cook growing up yeah i, I sure was you knew how to cook those hot dogs yeah microwave hot dogs yeah. right so you didn't learn much as being a cook there well i was putting my time in gotcha. i've never liked cooking still don't like cooking and uh, some things never change sure but i was not headed for vietnam i understand so graduate sound like you probably had a better time than you did in basic you graduate yes. you come back to Livonia you continue excuse me working your uh civilian job and then uh what six uh I would assume six years once a month two weeks in the summer that's correct okay so where was that unit at you said you were it in was, Detroit it was in, on East Sherwood in Detroit Michigan and then you also mentioned previously and, in this that you got transferred was that before I, or after yes I that was of course initially I was in the sex detachment there on East Sherwood mm -hmm. and I had I've already mentioned to you before we started this recording that I had mm -hmm. uh two very good friends Dave and John and then I uh, developed another friendship with Dave uh that we all hung around together outside of in civilian life and so they were my friends and they got had gotten into the reserves as drivers at the um i forget what unit it was over on school craft and still there uh army reserve center it's a transportation um outfit and uh so uh so they were telling me boy I wish we could come over and i says you know what uh, well, we got a new captain, Captain Kenny, and he was really a nice guy. And uh, so I uh, I was talking to different people, and apparently they said things to him, and, and there was no problem with that. And so I asked him, I says, could I transfer over there? I got my friends there. I live in Livonia. Uh, it would really be a real convenience, and I would really like it. And so he, he agreed. He, he signed a a transfer and allowed me to transfer over to there. And that was probably uh, uh, my last four years of the six year commitment that I So had. you you came back and you were at that detachment from after training, which would have been 1970 to 1972, say? Yes. And that from 72 to 76, you were in Livonia. Do you recall the na name of the unit there or the, the numbers? Uh, it, was, 
it was a transportation outfit. I don't re don't remember the number. Okay. And then when you did your once a month, did, were you always at the unit in either Detroit or Livonia, or yes. did you do training elsewhere on the weekend? No, we always trained there. Okay. And then what about your two weeks in and the then summer? In two weeks, we went up to Gray Lane. We went to Fort Custard. Uh, we went to, uh, gosh, we went down to Fort Knox one time. Uh, let's see if we go. Went to Fort Benning one time, uh, which was a horrible experience because it was so stinking. We went down there. Of course, you go down in the summertime. And so you went down Louisiana. to Fort, you went to Fort Benning, Georgia for two weeks. No, did I say Fort Benning? You did. I meant Fort Polk. Fort Polk, Louisiana. Yeah, Fort Polk, Louisiana. And please. from what I've read, that Fort Polk was uh, the closest looking post to what Vietnam, Vietnam was, yes, yes. right? So I assume maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe yes. not. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. So you're at Fort Polk uh, at your for AT in the summer. For, for Would you remember what year that was? No, I don't. Uh, was it towards the second half of the uh, six years? Or probably. probably. In fact, I know it was because I remember. So 74, friend. 75, mm -hmm. right around there. So what what, what was uh, so bad or great about those two weeks? Well, it was horribly hot. And I was not accustomed to being, <laughs> having born and raised in Michigan to have a constant 90 plus humidity and 90 plus temperature. And uh, I remember we we had a weekend off, uh, which probably I think was the only one. And we went uh, into New Orleans to go to the French Quarter, which was I didn't enjoy it at all. I hated it. And uh, but we got a car. We rented a car and uh, drove there, came back. And I never forget as to kind of illustrate how it was we stopped at the gas station because we we're kind of lost as to how to get the car back to the airport and so we stopped in the gas station and uh, uh i got out because i was driving and we i went in the station and the two guys that were in there very nice guys they told us where to go but they were they looked like they had just got out of a shower they were soaking wet and that was from sweat because of the humidity and heat, which which was very typical back then. After nine o'clock, maybe even earlier sometimes, you were soaking wet. So you there. were doing cook duty then? Or you know you're in transportation, I'm sorry. Transportation. So you what did you what was your daily AT like? Transporting was, officers or yeah, yes. Uh we were driving I was driving a Jeep back then. I don't remember driving a deuce and half or anything. Okay. Than, driving you'd be assigned an officer and drive him around so you're their driver yeah okay and it was so really you great just sat it. around and sweated all day yeah but, <laughs> but you could get underneath the tree there was things that you did but it right. was it was it was a, a good duty and uh i know that we had latitude a little bit if he said he's going to be a couple hours you could move and yeah there was different they they were pretty reasonable okay so then you do your six years any uh, by that time, what is 1975? Probably do yes. the math. So you're, you know, withdrawal in Vietnam has already been happening. You're probably either already completely out or, or about to be. Yes. Um, any thoughts on reing up, or were you good with your civilian back life? Then, back then, I didn't. I didn't as a group. Uh, a group of friends, right? That you mentioned. There's three right. good friends that I had, and we wanted nothing to do with the army at that point in time. We I understand. Did our time. Mm -hmm. And we were out, although I kind of regret it in a way now, but there's no way I was going to do it then. But in hindsight, I wished I would have stayed in because I liked it. In the I, reserves? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I liked it. I actually liked it. Uh, in I, hindsight? Yes. Okay. I really did. I well, you were, basic training. By, by, that, by that point, you were still probably pretty young. So yeah, uh, 24, 25 years 20. old. 20, yeah. yeah, so sometimes, yeah, I mean, everyone makes decisions younger right. that they and would I had, on my, I had two friends that were that were very adamant in their <laughs> for the military. Sure. Um, okay. So I didn't mind. Do you talk to anybody still from back then, or have you? You're pretty good at remembering names from basic. I can't can't say I can. Yeah. So it's well, pretty interesting. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave Nichols, John Duncan, Dave Sass were my three good friends. That, like I said, I hung around with them. In civilian life they were okay friends. okay and uh and other than that i can't remember any of your names 
Yeah, understandable. Now with my detachment. Uh, Which I, detachment? The first one or the second? Yeah. First one? First one, yeah. Okay. Um, I uh, had, I developed friendships there as well. Good. In fact, I had a, a guy who had went to Brightmoor Tavern after the church I went to. Mm-hmm. And um, he was in, and he was like my big brother uh, because he was, I had already been in for two, three years, and he was just really, a, really took me underneath his wing, which really made it nice. And of course, you know, uh, made it good for me. Good. And then you were discharged, obviously, and then you continued on with your civilian life. You said you, you mentioned you worked at the city of Livonia for 31 years. What year did you retire? Uh, back in 99. 99. And then obviously I was born in 82. Um, Tim, my brother, was born in what year? 86. 86. And then mom, Jean Better, uh, you guys got married in what year? Uh, 82. Uh, 81. 81. 81. I like how you had to look over to make sure that was the right year. It was 81. We all do that. <laughs> August, so, August 1st, wasn't it, of 81? Yep, eight one eight one. So then, ninety nine retire. What have you been doing since nineteen ninety nine? Given it's twenty four years later. Okay, uh, I was I did some lots, and I remember I we did those together. A mm-hmm. uh, small little um, had I think we had eight lawns, and we helped that helped pay for your ice time because mm-hmm. you and Timmy both you initially were the only one playing. Then Timmy started playing, and then uh, we did those lawns to help pay for our ice time. Okay. Uh, and then uh, mom suggested, because of course you cut lawns in the wintertime. So I believe mom, this is accurate. You suggested that I go over to the bus garage because they had a sign out front and that here in Pickney. And she said, you know, it's kind of what you want. And I enjoy kids. And so I went over there and they hired me. I was there for only really theoretically a year because Timmy, your youngest brother, of course, and only brother, got in a horrific car accident. And so I was off work for over a year because of his situation, because I was his 24 seven nurse after he was sure. discharged. And uh, so I ended up going and they had back then, they didn't have the need of what they now have. And I'm talking about bus drivers. And so when I went back, they had filled my position. So I said, it's fine. Of course, I had no choice about it. But anyhow, I went over to Brighton just at a whim. I just I was in Brighton and thought I saw the bus garage and stopped in. And uh, uh, the lady there, Sue Watkins, uh, walked in and I says, are you hiring? And she says, well... I, and I said, you know, I have my all my accreditations and my CDL and all the rest. And so she, so Betty came out of her office and and uh, she talked to me in just a few minutes. And she said, "What do you think, Sue?" And she and Sue says, "Hire him." So she hired me. So that began my 23 years of driving bus for Brighton schools. Oh, how interesting! Excuse me, 20 years. So 2003 to 20, you just. Yeah. This year, retired year 23. Retired. Okay. And I should also add, you mentioned Pinckney. You've lived here in Pinckney for since what year? How long? Uh, 94, we moved here. Okay. So that's kind of where we retire. Um, so very interesting story. I'm glad you shared that. That was a lot more detail than I ever remember, even though I do some remember some of those stories. So um, uh, I guess we'll wrap up. Uh, and I appreciate you doing this. So one last question, which we've already kind of you know, I got the heads up on it. In a hundred years, what do you want people listening to this to take away from it? Uh, well, the most important thing to me, I think you know this, is that uh, anybody and everybody that hears my voice will have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And um, I have to say this, and the reason being, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man's comes to the Father, but through me. It's through Jesus, and God says so. God makes the rules because he's God. He said, you must be born again, and that means you must accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior if you want to go to heaven. And uh, anything else will lead you to hell. That's what I would want for everybody 
to take away from what I've said today. Okay. Appreciate that. Sure. And thank you for your time. Um, great story. And, and obviously reflecting on the Vietnam uh, time, uh, our nation really never had a time like that. It was, it was, it was different. Um, it wasn't a war that where we were attacked, we were kind of, um, brought into it, you know, politically, so to speak. Yes. Um, and it was, uh, you know, interesting time and it's interesting to hear it. What a 19 year old mind would have been thinking for that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, thanks for sharing. Sure. Um, and you know, thanks for your time and sure. hopefully moving forward, people, that listen to this now and in the future will appreciate as much as we have. Let me leave you with this one last thought. Uh, is that if I wouldn't have been able to go in the reserves, I most certainly, uh, there is no second thought I would have went in to the regular army. There is no- As a draftee. As a draftee. Uh, there is no variance there. I wasn't gonna do anything other than, but the reserves offered me a great opportunity not to have to go in and uh, I was very, very grateful for that. And we all are too. So thank you for your time today. And that'll wrap it up. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to another episode of Veterans Archives, the podcast that brings you the story of the men and women who have created and lived our military history. If you or someone you know served in the military and would like to share your story with Veterans Archives, please go to www.veteransarchives.org, select the Apply Now button, and fill out our application, and someone will get right back with you. Veterans Archives is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we rely on the donations of our listeners. If you are enjoying these stories and you support our efforts, please go to www.veteransarchives.org and select the Donate button. Any donation is certainly appreciated. Look for Veterans Archives on your favorite social media. We are on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Just look for Veterans Archives. Like, follow, and share our page. We'd certainly appreciate it. If you or someone you know is a veteran and you are struggling with mental health issues, please dial 988 and select option one for the Veterans Crisis Hotline. Please be sure to tune in next time for the next episode of Veterans Archives.